This is one of the videos showing the change makers in the field of speech language pathology focused on appropriate disability evaluations. Here, Kine Sedler, a bilingual Spanish English speech language pathologist who has worked in the schools in New York and Florida, will talk about the uh, language variations of American English and what the research shows about that and how important it is for anyone doing an evaluation to identify a language disorder to have a deep understanding of varieties of English, sentence structures, and what that might mean when you're trying to see whether a child has a true disorder or not. Hello everyone, my name is Kine Sudler and I'm a bilingual speech language pathologist. I currently work at a Title I school in Bushwick, Brooklyn. The population of my school is so diverse. We have a lot of Black, African-American, Caribbean students, and students who come from Spanish-speaking homes. So I'm always hearing different kinds of language in the hallways um, as I'm walking through and rushing to pick up my students for our sessions. Today, I'm going to be talking about language varieties and considerations for assessment. So we first have to agree on one fact, and that is that language varies. It's always changing. It never stays the same. Think about if you picked up a book by Chaucer or sat down to listen to a play by Shakespeare. The type of English that you would hear in those texts is so different from the type of English that we use today. Or take a moment to talk to your parents, your grandparents. The slang they use is going to be different from the words and the terms that your children or your students are using. What about technology? Words like Google, tweet, selfie weren't even invented 20 years ago. And social context matters. We're going to speak differently if we're talking to our friends and our family than if we're talking to our bosses. So language varies. It should come as no surprise then that we have many different varieties of English in the United States. The exact terms that we use to label these varieties are constantly changing, but here are some common ones. African-American English, Appalachian English, Spanish-influenced English, Chinese-influenced English, right? And again, it doesn't mean, for example, that only African-Americans speak African-American English or that that's the only variety they speak. These are just the terms that are commonly used. So these language varieties are not random. They're not arbitrary. They're patterned and they're rule-governed. That means that when we hear differences in phonology and sound, when we hear differences, differences in syntax, or when we see differences in vocabulary, those are all based on a rule governed pattern system. These varieties and others like it are often called non mainstream varieties of English in comparison to a variety that we typically call mainstream American English or standard American English. What is that? That's the language that we are encouraged to use in formal situations, such as at jobs or at an interview. That's the language that we're often going to hear newscasters use. It's the language that we're encouraged to use in schools. It's the language that our students are going to see on most of their high stakes standardized assessments mainstream American English. Does the fact that mainstream American English is used in so many contexts mean that it's better? Definitely not. There are issues of power, there are issues of social class that contribute to the social value of mainstream American English that we have today. In fact, all language varieties are intrinsically and inherently equal. No variety is better or worse than any other variety. This is something that I saw when I was scrolling through social media. I don't judge people based on race, 
creed, color, or gender. I judge people based on spelling, grammar, punctuation, and sentence structure. It's supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to be funny, but is it? The language that we speak is intimately connected to who we are. So if people are judging us based on the way we speak, then they are judging us based on our identity as well. Let's look at Ash's position statement on social dialects from 1983. I especially wanna talk about this bold portion. No dialectal variety of English is a disorder or a pathological form of speech or language. In other words, a language difference is not a language disorder. So it's our job as speech and language pathologists to discriminate between a language difference versus a language disorder. And I especially like the way that Odding and other researchers put it. We need to identify if there's a disorder within an individual's unique dialect. So what happens when the tests we use to determine language impairment are designed for mainstream American English speakers? Well, that's when we get a lot of misdiagnoses. We have typically developing students who speak non-stream main, non mainstream varieties diagnosed as having language impairments, or we have those students diagnosed as not having language impairments when they in fact do have one. This is unacceptable, it's unethical, and we're not going to do that. What about scoring modifications? You may think, okay, I have this standardized assessment. What if I just give the child credit for responses that are correct in their dialects, but incorrect in mainstream American English? Well, there are some challenges and some problems with that approach. First, scoring modifications can be applied for production tasks where the child is speaking, producing something, but not comprehension tasks. Second, a number of items, the number of items affected by modifications can vary greatly depending on the task. So you might have some tasks which encourage more speaking and hence you might see different amount of non-mainstream American English features being used. Also, speakers differ in how often they use these features and they may not use all of the features within a particular dialect. There's variation. Some are not as frequent, some are not as common. Finally, there's limited research available on how modifications affect diagnostic accuracy, meaning how well we are discriminating between students who really do have language impairments and students who do not. Let's take a deeper look at this study from 2017 by Hendricks and Adloff. In this study, the researchers administered the CELL-4 and the DELV-S to 299 second grade students from South Carolina. Now, the issue with the CELL is that items might be scored incorrectly for mainstream American English, even though they might be correct for other language varieties. But the DELVS doesn't do that because it only uses items that would be acceptable in both of those language varieties. So the researchers use these assessments to investigate how modifying the scoring affected the diagnostic accuracy of the self for Black African American participants who spoke AAE. Now, if you remember, we have a standard that we need to uphold when we are judging whether a test has enough uh, validity that, so that we could be able to use it to assess students. It needs to be 80 or 90%, the Banton Plant Standard, to be fair and 90 or better to be good. 
If it's less than 80, it's unacceptable and we should not be using that assessment. Without modifications, 88% of students with language impairment in this study were accurately identified. 48% of typically developing students were accurately identified, meaning over 50% were not identified correctly with the self. What about with modification? Surely that's going to help. That's going to make things better, right? Well, 63% of students with language impairment were accurately identified and 63% of typically developing students were accurately identified. This is unacceptable. We have to think very carefully about the assessments we're using because as we agree, language varies and all languages are equal in linguistic terms. So if we're using assessments, even with modifications that are penalizing our students for their language varieties, we are not doing our jobs correctly and we are not following ethical practice. This video and a number of others showing our change makers will go together to form an online course available at leadersproject.org that will also be offered for ASHA CEUs. It will be free and you will meet your ethical and culturally responsive requirements.